All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we are here today jumping into 1 Timothy chapter 1. I just want to also uh, mention briefly, we did a, a long video on an introduction to the pastoral epistles. And so in that we covered 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus because they were all written by the same author to a similar effect with similar content and were written within a, a less than five year, maybe even less than three year period. Um, so I, I dated those around uh, mid 60s AD, probably around 63 or so AD, uh, 63 and 65, somewhere between there. But if you're really interested in some of the backdrop of this, I I'd highly, highly encourage you, uh, please check out that introduction. Uh, if you're really a serious Bible student and you really want to get uh, cultural understanding biblically of what other information is in the Bible to point us towards what's going on during this time, I'd strongly encourage that. So without uh, further ado, with that being said, uh, we're going to jump into 1 Timothy today and uh, specifically chapter 1. And in chapter 1, there's a couple things we're going to find. Um, Paul begins into one of many of the uh, church issues. Uh, I should say a few of many of the church issues uh, that he's going to deal with, uh, namely false doctrine and false teaching. Uh, he's going to encourage Timothy in that light. And he's going to encourage him to um, deal with those false teachers personally and also to teach correct doctrine. And we're going to talk a little bit today about the false doctrine, the false teaching, the wrong teaching that was uh, being taught at the church in Ephesus. And also, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, as this text deals with some of Paul's background as who, who he is and where he's coming from, we're going to jump around a little bit in the text, focused on 1 Timothy chapter 1, but as other texts can help us, we're going to jump around to get some commentary on that. For both Paul and Timothy, we're going to learn some interesting things about these guys that I think are going to be really helpful to unpack and to better understand their faith journey. Lastly, at the end of chapter one, we're going to talk a little bit about church discipline as it is addressed in this text and referenced in this text. And uh, we're going to talk about what Jesus has to say there a little bit. So uh, without further ado, uh, chapter one, I'm going to read and stop to pull things out and to reference my Bible. I've got down here uh, some notes in my Bible. So forgive me if I'm looking down. I'm just reading all these notes in my Bible. And hopefully I'll link that, uh, that picture in another video, maybe to the introduction of the pastoral epistles, some uh, notes there. But Anyways, it says, uh, if you'll look on the screen with me, uh, again, we're in the CSB. Uh, hopefully this is readable and easily understandable without giving up um, uh, some of the original language content. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And so in this, we see a typical introduction. Paul is writing to Timothy. Uh, he calls him my true son in the faith. And I think this is interesting. Uh, what Paul's hinting at, obviously, uh, he is not uh, biologically Timothy's father. But as we talked about in the introduction, uh, these two have been um, intimately linked for some time. Uh, many, many years. And it seems that, that Paul and Timothy, in a sense that Timothy has latched onto Paul as a, a real father in the faith. And, and Paul has taught Timothy, you better believe everything he believes theologically, everything he believes uh, about who God is, what God is like, also what the Bible is teaching, also what to be believing about various challenging issues that the, the church is facing. And so, if I could use the words a chip off the old block, uh, Timothy is probably that of Paul. And so he calls him his true son in the faith. And we went really deep into this in the introduction. But elsewhere, Paul speaks of uh, no one is like Timothy, mentioning that, man, Timothy is just truly a, an apple that didn't fall far from the tree. And so they are very close. And Paul has this love for him uh, that seems very, very deep. He says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. In Christ Jesus our Lord, 
he goes on to say, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine or to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. These promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. And so as we talked about in the introduction, uh, Paul travels around and Timothy travels around with him. And at this point in their journey, Paul is leaving Timothy alone in Ephesus uh, to this big church, this big place. We're not sure how big the church was, but we do know that uh, it is in present day Turkey. And at the time of writing, uh, it's estimated that there was somewhere around 250,000 people in this city. So it's not a small city. It's a rather large city. And uh, they are kind of at the epicenter of that, uh, the third largest city in the, the Roman Empire. So Paul is encouraging Timothy to, to stay and to fight. He's encouraging him, uh, listen here, so so that you may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine. Okay, so we're not sure whether these two men, which we're going to get to in the text in just a minute, that are kicked out. Um, we're not sure that these are elders. So I wouldn't say these are elders. We don't see an explicit reference that these guys are elders. But we do see that there's certain people. Uh, we know at least of two of them. And it could have grown to those people they have influenced. But there's a group of people within this church that are teaching false doctrine, which is a, a very dangerous place to be with enough false gospel belief. We end up uh, being far away from a true gospel. And uh, we know that Jesus is the only way uh, to heaven, to salvation. And so if we step outside of that true and faithful gospel, uh, surely uh, we can step far enough away that our our salvation is lost um, if we are not holding on to that that one true Lord and that one true gospel. So he says, uh, so that you can instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine or to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. Here what we're seeing is some of what's going on in this church and what the teachers are wrongly focusing on. So he says, he wants Timothy to instruct people to not to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies and why he tells us, he says, these promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. So the, the focus of these churches, um, namely of the teachers to the uh, congregants of this church, they're beginning to focus on, on less important things. They're, they're beginning to turn their eyes off of Christ and turn their eyes off of God's mission, which is that, that us who have received salvation, who have received the Holy Spirit, that we can then take this love and this new way of life and mission and belief and share it with the world uh, and share uh, with those who are far from God uh, the message that He has come down to earth. He has lived the life we could not live. He has died the death that we deserve to die. And he has, in fact, rose again from the dead in order to give us life and, and life abundantly. And so these people, are they're getting away from this essential truth message and they're turning their focus then to these uh, myths or untrue stories or parables and endless genealogies. And if you don't know what a genealogy is, a genealogy is kind of like uh, something you might find on Ancestry.com or, or something of the like where we track uh, whose dad was whose dad was whose dad and we follow this family tree uh, to a distance to see uh, throughout history this, this bloodline lineage. And so the Bible is not anti-genealogy. As a matter of fact, the Bible's full of a couple genealogies. Namely, there's one in Genesis, uh, a couple in Genesis that we see as the Bible traces this bloodline as the promise of Jesus Christ, the, the God-man who is going to be resurrected. As a matter of fact, uh, all the way back to Genesis, uh, in the curse of uh, Adam and Eve and the serpent, we see a, a promise from God that uh, from their lineage, from their bloodline, from their genealogy, is going to be a Savior who's going to be Jesus. And, and they didn't know that then, but we know that now. And so 
Genealogies are not far from the heart of God or something he doesn't want us to know or study. Also, all the way, if you go to the first book in the New Testament, the book of Matthew, and also another one of the Gospels, they begin with a genealogy tracing Jesus Christ's lineage through both his father and mother, depending on which of the Gospels you're reading. So genealogies are essential. They point to his story and historical truth and lineage in a very powerful way. And we'll, we'll unpack those when we're in those texts. But I just want to mention here, as we're talking about genealogies, what, what Paul's instructing Timothy to turn the church away from is endless genealogies, as it says in uh, verse, verse 4. And so we can uh, rightly discern that the, the genealogies they're focusing on are, are not these genealogies. It's some other kind of genealogy that doesn't lead to an end that's, that's helpful, that, that proves historical accuracy for the Christian faith. It's something else, and it's distracting, and also some kinds of myths of which we're not told, which are, uh, like I said, getting people away from this, this uh, gospel truth of this resurrected King Jesus, uh, who is our uh, God and our Savior. So he says, these promote empty speculations rather than God's plan. So people, instead of spending their time sharing the gospel, deepening the gospel love, deepening in their lives personally and in that of their family and in that of their workplace and their neighbors, instead of that mission, they're getting caught up and focused on another mission, which is the mission of figuring out <laughs> endless genealogies and myths of which there's no fruit. There's no fruit. Like if I am loving a God and neighbor and, and growing deeply in these relationships and loving well in these relationships, there's a, a something to be gained there. But if all I'm doing is spending my time in endless genealogies and myths, there's nothing to be gained there from the end. So he's really trying to help Timothy challenge him to, to steer the church away from these, these things. He says these promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. And he says here, verse five, I love verse five. And if you're taking notes, verse four, what I would tell you is that uh, sound doctrine leads to God's plan, whereas false doctrine leads to emptiness or fruitlessness. To repeat that, I'll say that sound doctrine, uh, belief, sound belief, leads to right living, leads to God's plan, whereas false doctrine or, or wrong thinking of God and his word leads to emptiness or fruitlessness, something other than God's plan. And so our theological teaching should lead us to a supernatural love. The things we believe and understand and see about God and his world and his word should lead us to a life of love and a pursuit of others in that love. Whereas uh, wrong focus can, can distract us from that mission. But verse 5, I would say that 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, in this one sentence, we really contain a, what, what I would like to call a, a gold nugget of, um, of a truth in that it is a, a summary of what I would say is Christian maturity. And um, I'll just read this, verse 5. It, Paul tells Timothy, he says, the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So Paul is saying, look, the end result, what we're seeking in, in people's lives is love, right? Living people, a group of people, the church, living in love that's coming from a pure heart, right? A right motives, a pure heart, uh, meaning uh, right intentions behind these generous, loving acts, a good conscience, they're living uprightly, uh, their thought life, their heart life, their uh, conscience, right versus wrong, what they're doing um, is pure, it's good, it's, um, it's, it's godly, um, and also a sincere faith. And so all these things, the, the pure heart, the, the good conscience, the loving acts and deeds of life, they're overflowing from a sincere faith in the, the resurrected one. They're overflowing from a deep trust and belief in, in Jesus, the Savior, and uh, his present um, 
present seat right here at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And so with those, that's really a good little nugget, a good little sentence on what Christian maturity looks like in your life. If you're not sure what, what's the point of studying the Bible, what's the point of growing deep in the Word, that's the end goal of life that's maturing as a Christian is going to always be growing and growing into uh, those, those three things. And uh, he says in verse 6, he says, Some have departed from these things and turned aside to fruitless discussion. And so what, what's happening is these teachers of the Bible at this church are focusing on the wrong things and they're focusing on things uh, maybe even outside of the scriptures that are then going to lead the church towards pointless living, pointless discussion. They're going to be arguing and debating and they're going to be talking through things that, that at the end of the day don't matter and aren't central. And so they're wasting everyone's time and uh, there's a real accountability there. And so Timothy's hopefully uh, stuck there, left by Paul, to uh, do some cleanup, some cleaning house there. He says in uh, verse 7, he says, They want to be teachers of the law. Speaking of these teachers at this church, they want to be teachers of the law, although they don't understand what they are saying or what they are insisting on. Okay, so we're going to talk about this as we get to it uh, within these texts, but I'll give you a little, a little uh, foreshadowing. They're going to be insisting on um, certain rules for sex, certain rules for what they're allowed to eat, uh, certain rules on following the Jewish law that is now null and void, which we'll talk about in the future in uh, other chapters of the Bible. But these teachers of the law, they're insisting on these works of the law that are no longer required for Gentile believers. And so Paul, when he's saying they don't know what they're talking about, they don't know what they're saying, what they're insisting on, what he's getting at, and, and this is such a central truth to the New Testament, what he's getting at is, is he's saying that by bringing in these added rules, these added regulations for the Christian faith, they're in fact departing from the Christian faith. And no longer uh, salvation is by grace through faith, but instead salvation is by grace through faith and these other things, by works, by these other things you got to do. And that's a, a serious departure from New Testament uh, simple faith. Um, the, the Bible is called to faith and belief and following Christ. It's a whole abandonment of oneself and one's way of life. But it's a simple faith that forgives us. It's a, it's a simple, all-encompassing faith that uh, we give our, our hearts and lives to the Lord. And uh, He takes us how we are. And that's just the simple, simple gospel. And to add in other things that, that are required to be accepted by God in the beginning stages of salvation is, is a departure from the Christian faith and Christian confession. And so that's what he's talking about. They don't know what they're saying. They don't know what they're insisting on. Uh, they're really stripping Christianity of everything that it's meant to be. And so Paul's really um, trying to open Timothy's eyes and open the eyes of the church there through Timothy about that. And he goes on to speak about the law. He says, uh, but we know that the law is good. We know that the law is good. And here in just a second, we're going to jump into Galatians to talk about Paul's teaching of the law that's going to be really helpful for you. Um, but he says, we know the law is good. And when he's speaking of the law, he's speaking of Old Testament law. Uh, think of the Ten Commandments and a lot of these uh, lifestyle laws that are encompassed in those things. We know that the law is good, provided one uses it legitimately. So only if one uses it legitimately. We know that the law is not meant for a righteous person, but for the lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinful, for the unholy and irreverent, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral and, and males who uh, have sex with males, homosexuality, for slave traders, right? Those buy and sell human beings, uh, liars, perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, 
which was entrusted to me. And so what Paul does here is he says that the law is good and the law is very basic. Do not murder. That's a, a very basic morality. And so when he's talking about, he says that uh, it's not for the righteous, it's, it's for the lawless, the rebellious. The Ten Commandments, hopefully the average person is, is following uh, things like do not murder, do not commit adultery. And, and Jesus goes on to talk about the extent of the heart and soul and how strenuous it would be to keep that holy. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But, but uh, he's talking about how this law and some of these things, it's, it's just basic Christian ethics, uh, basic Christian morality. And, and false teaching leads us away from, from right living and leads us towards uh, all kinds of ungodliness. And so, if you will, I'm going to turn real quick uh, for us to Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at, uh, let's see, verse uh, 10 and following. And this is another section, another letter. One of the first letters that Paul wrote was uh, Galatians and he's dealing with what the law is for. We're going to dive into this briefly. Uh, we'll deal with this extensively when we're in Galatians. But for now, we're just going to look at this. Verse 10, Galatians 3. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, because it is written, everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. In other words, unless you follow the law to perfection, you're cursed, right? So who can follow the law and keep it? Well, no one, no human being. And that's why we needed Jesus. Jesus, the God man to come to the earth and live under the law with perfection. And in that set us, everyone else, free from the law so that we don't come to God through the law. But now we come to God through faith. Because if it's through the law, we're never going to get there. We're never going to live that perfect life that Jesus lived. But instead, we can by faith have his account transactioned onto our account. And through faith, uh, we can be born again and live new life in Christ instead of in ourselves. So he says, every one who does not do everything written in the book of the law uh, is cursed. He's quoting here Deuteronomy 27 verse 26. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous, excuse me, the righteous will live by faith, right? The way we get to God is by faith, not by works. It's by who we trust in and not what we do because if it's by what we do and we take all of what we've done here on earth into account, not everything is going to be good. Not everything that we've done is right. Matter of fact, the majority of things that we've done is wrong. Uh, all these sins we've committed, anything that we've thought, we've said, or we've uh, done um, that breaks God's law that God hates, these are all sinful acts. Every lie, every curse, every uh, thought of hatred we've had in our heart, every time we've ever coveted or desired something that wasn't ours, each and every single one of these acts are, are sins. And so these, these create us uh, people who are guilty before God. And so the righteous live by faith. The righteous people are not those who have lived perfect lives, but they've trusted in God. The righteous will live by faith. They put their faith in God and that has made them righteous. But the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, as we just talked about. Because it is written, cursed is everyone uh, who is hung on a tree. He's quoting Deuteronomy 21, 23 here, referencing in Deuteronomy the foretelling of the one who would be cursed, who would be hung on a tree, talking of Jesus. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles by Christ Jesus so that we could receive the promised spirit through faith. Such good. The promise was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles, namely that they would be blessed and in him would be redemption. Brothers and sisters, I'm using a human illustration. No one sets aside or makes additions to a validated human will. 
Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed or his children. He does not say and to seeds as though referring to many, but referring to one and to your seed, who is Christ. As we know, there was a, a particular choice of Abraham's children. And we're not going to go too deep into this. Uh, we will when we talk through this book, but there was a specific lineage choice of a child, which was Isaac, instead of, um, I'm trying to think, the other child that was uh, born to him by the slave woman, uh, Hagar, um, Ishmael. There it is. Uh, so Abraham's promised lineage was through Isaac, but ultimately through Isaac, right, and so on and so forth, through that genealogy comes Jesus Christ. And so that's what he's referencing here, Old Testament foreshadowing into the New Testament. He says this, my point is this, as we're trying to understand the purpose of the law, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant uh, previously established by God and thus cancel the promise. So let's understand what he's saying here. What he's saying is that God made a covenant promise with Abraham in the Old Testament, which was that uh, through faith, it can be accounted uh, unto our account as righteousness. So our faith can equal righteousness, our trust in God and our faith to be obedient to the things he's given us namely to put our faith and trust in him, is then accounted uh, on our account as righteousness. And so he says, this happened 430 years before the law was given through Moses. So just because Moses received this law, it doesn't make null and void the promise to Abraham. So the law, it's not for salvation. It's for for guiding the nation of Israel, it's for right living, it's for morality, for many things, but it's not for salvation, it's for uh, something else. But what's for salvation is that promise that was given to Abraham that the the righteous will live by faith. Um, So he says the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously established by God and thus cancel the promise. For if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on the promise, but God has graciously given to Abraham uh, through the promise. And here's why we're jumping into this. He says in 19, why then was the law given? Because as Paul was just saying in 1 Timothy chapter 1, (coughs) he says we know the law is good. And so he's, he's saying, why is the law given? He's answering that here. It was added for the sake of transgressions, right, or sins, Another word for that, um, he says, until the seed, and you see it's capitalized here. I don't know if you can see on the screen, so we know that's talking of Christ. To whom the promise was made would come. The law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. Now a mediator is not just for one person alone, but God is one. Is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? Absolutely not. For if the law had been granted with the ability to give life, then the righteousness uh, would certainly be on the basis of the law. So what he's saying, he's saying don't get the law given to Moses mixed up with the promise given to Abraham. Through Abraham, we see a promise of salvation, a faith equals uh, righteousness covenant. And through the law, we don't see Uh, righteousness through the law. It's something else. So um, he says in verse uh, 21, is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? Absolutely not. For if the law had been granted with the ability to give life, then righteousness would certainly be on the basis of law. But here's the thing, folks. We cannot get righteousness through the law. We're not good enough. And that's not its purpose. We get righteousness through faith. But instead, what is the purpose of the law? Verse 22. But the scripture or the law imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Christ Jesus to those who believe. So through the law, every sin can be placed because the law has been given Everyone becomes guilty. This is what Paul talks about in Romans. But, but because of the law, 
all sin can be grouped together under the law. And in that, it's not that we're going to find our salvation there, but it can all be placed on this one central thing, which Jesus then then can do uh, a perfect life, then can do a perfect account and transaction. And then all this can be placed on the back of our Savior, Jesus. And through that, he can then put to death all of this sin that has now been centralized and, and placed into one uh, spot on the back of Christ. He can then uh, live that perfect life with the weight of sin and then take the weight of sin with him to the grave and abolish all sin. And then in his resurrection, uh, he can be the one to conquer this for us. And truly, we can place the, the sin in our life on the back of Christ and it can be uh, crucified with him and put to death with him. And then we can be resurrected with him. And so he says, um, Scripture was imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian for through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. So what he's saying here essentially is that the law was given so that we could be held on to the Jewish people what would have something to hold on to, to take the place of, to point them towards Christ. And then upon the arrival of Christ onto earth, all that they followed in, in part, was was done away with. And so the laws of God were, were then extended for a temporal time, for a temporal nation, for a temporal people, to then take it worldwide. And so while the nation of Israel uh, still exists, the way to become a worshiper and lover of God is no longer to become a Jewish person or a, or a worshiper of God by that means, but we can now be Gentiles or non-Jews and come into uh, Christ, come into faith in Christ and become a Christian. Um, so I just wanted to jump there really briefly uh, to talk a little bit about the law. So to recap, we are uh, in this church in Ephesus with Timothy, and he's got a bunch of people that are trying to teach uh, other fellow church members that they need to follow this law to be saved, to be Christians. And Paul is saying, you're missing the purpose of the law. That's not what it was for. And these people are leading others astray because if they're trying to put their faith and trust into honoring the law, they can't do it in perfection and they're going to be lost. They're going to be separated from God because the way to God is not works of the law, but rather faith in Christ. And so um, he really confronts them on that. Paul goes on to say here, as we read through verse 11, jump with me to verse 12. Paul's going to talk a little bit about uh, his testimony and, and how he came to Christ. He says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man, but I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so we see that uh, Paul has this testimony. If you're familiar with Paul, you already know this. But if you're not, excuse me. If you're not familiar with Paul, he was a Pharisee, right? A teacher of, of the Old Testament. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? He was an expert in matters of the law, blameless in the matters of the law. And he also went on to persecute the church. We see that clearly in the book of Acts. He's holding coats while people pick up huge rocks to stone uh, some of the greatest Christians in the beginning of the church. Stephen is who I'm talking about. This guy that was stoned as he preached the gospel. Uh, to Jewish people. So Paul has got a lot of guilt. Paul's got a lot of uh, wrongdoing. And if anything, if God deserved to overlook anyone, Paul's saying, it's me. 
But he says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. The, the gospel truth of Jesus Christ was right there in front of him for a while. He had studied the scriptures and he had seen uh, the life of Jesus and the effects of Jesus and uh, the stories of Jesus, but had still missed it. He says, but I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. He was ignorant. He didn't know. He didn't know better. His unbelief wasn't out of a... a uh, a, a, a lack of desire to follow Yahweh. His his arrogance, his unbelief was in a, a lack of trust in Jesus. But he was still trying to follow God, but he didn't know that the God he was trying to follow is Jesus. He, he had missed it. And the grace of our Lord overflowed, he says in verse 14, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And so in his encounter with Christ, this this faith and love overflowed from Jesus onto Paul and brought him into the family on the road to Damascus. He says, uh, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I receive mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience. I love that. As an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. That includes me and you. Um, Paul was, was sent by God to be an example of how patient God can be. How patient God can be. Paul persecuted uh, Jesus' people. Paul was... Uh, not only a persecutor, but he was a blasphemer because he spoke against Jesus unknowing that Jesus was God. And also Paul's arrogant. He was so set in his ways and his mind and his, his thought towards the things of God that he missed the very God uh, when he came here to earth. And so Paul received mercy. And he says one of these reasons that he received is because uh, Jesus came to earth to save sinners, people like you and me, people everywhere across the world, uh, everyone who's not Jesus. Uh, we are people who are sinful and we need the blood of Christ to cover us. And, and Paul, his life and his example is something God wanted to use to show us how patient God is with people. And so Paul, uh, one who persecuted Christians, um, is now a great example of, well, maybe you did something terrible in your past. Maybe in your background, you have some really gross, egregious, ugly sin. But God is patient and God is gracious and God is merciful. And if we turn to him, he's willing to wipe all of that clean and, and put all of those uh, wrong, evil acts onto the blood uh, of Christ, onto the back of Christ. And in Christ, all that sin can be paid for in full. And crucified with him so that we can be uh, crucified with him and resurrected with him in forgiveness and grace and new life. And so Paul's sharing his testimony with Timothy is reminding him because he wants Timothy to see that that uh, God is so patient with people. And he wants Timothy to keep this in mind not only for himself, as Timothy may slip up from time to time, but also for these false teachers. While Paul wants him to be stern with them to remove them from, from maybe the church at times. He still wants him to be patient and gracious with them because ultimately the goal is that they are brought into the fold, into the group, into salvation. And so Paul is referencing his life and his blindness so that, that they can uh, see that God is patient with people. And for Timothy to share that same patience with these false teachers and these other Christians that have strayed, while he may need to take decisive action to remove them or separate them or, or kick them out, he still needs to be patient and realize that, that hopefully they can one day come back to the faith. So um, he says all of that in verse 12 uh, through 14. 15, he says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. 
Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I receive mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate, as we already said, his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. And he says in verse 17, Now to the King eternal, he's speaking of Jesus, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And Paul recognizes that, that Jesus is Yahweh, this Old Testament God that they have seen and loved and devoted their life to and worshiped, that his people have seen and loved and devoted their lives to for generation after generation. Paul is, is proclaiming here quite clearly that Jesus Christ, our Lord, right? He is he is the immortal one. He is the eternal one. He is the invisible one. He is the only God. And and do Jesus is honor and uh, glory. And so Paul's making a definitive statement here. He closes in this, this first chapter. He says, Timothy, my son, I, I'm giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you. I really want to make a big deal about this. I want to jump into this. I think this is really interesting verse here we have, and I think it gives us some really interesting backdrop and uh, some things to really pick up on. Uh, Previously made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and have shipwrecked their faith. So we know if, if you watch the introduction, I hope that was a very helpful video. If you watch the introduction, we talk about Paul's missionary journeys and how he gets uh, from Tarsus to Lystra, where we find Timothy, um, Paul being very instrumental in Timothy's spiritual life. And he says here in verse 18, he says, I'm giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you. We see this same uh, thing talked about in the pastoral epistles later on, and we're going to talk about that as we come across it later. Uh, Paul says that he was among the others that laid hands on Timothy to affirm this gifting in Timothy's life. But here, other than that verse, we don't have all the answers. I wish we did. I, I wish we could see all that had taken place in the timeline in Timothy's life. But what we can see is that to some degree, there was prophetic utterances made over Timothy's life. We don't know if this was through Paul. It doesn't seem to be. It seems to be either someone in the church or a group in the church um, led by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, uh, made prophetic utterance over Timothy uh, for his calling, for his calling as a, as a elder, as a apostolic servant as a shepherd of people. Uh, Timothy has a very high calling uh, to which he was one day a martyr for in his life, unwilling to give up even to death. And this Holy Spirit calling that, that led Timothy into the ministry was given to him through the Holy Spirit. And so Paul, he says, I'm giving you this instruction keeping with the prophecies. So Paul says, look, the, the Holy Spirit has separated you for this work that you're doing. He's saying, everything that I'm telling you, it's in line with what the Holy Spirit has already told you to do. And so the Holy Spirit is guiding this whole process. The Holy Spirit to this day guides the process of bringing people into ministry, calling people into ministry, holding them in ministry when they get tired and worn out. Uh, this is the Holy Spirit's work in the church for over a uh, 2,000 years now. But here we see that, that Timothy was called into ministry. I think it's so interesting, this verse. And it's by some kind of prophetic uh, utterance, some kind of prophecy that was proclaimed over him. And, and Paul references this more than once to, to call Timothy to toughen up, to call Timothy to hold on tight to that. And he says, by recalling them, you may fight the good fight. So Paul wants Timothy to trust in the Holy Spirit. Paul wants Timothy to be tough and to fight. And to when he gets down, he wants him to remember these prophecies made over him. And when he's having a hard time or he's doubting his calling, Paul wants Timothy 
to be reminded of the prophecy over him and this foretelling of the future of what Timothy's life is going to hold. Paul wants Timothy to keep that in mind at all times. And he wants to encourage him in that light. He says, having faith and a good conscience. And he says here, which some have rejected, which some have rejected and have shipwrecked their faith. Here he's talking about, as he'll say, verse 20, among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered to Satan, that they may be taught not to blaspheme. So uh, before we close, we're going to unpack this last verse. This is a challenging use of words, but I think if we really dive into it and think biblically, that's crucial. If we, if we make sure we have a biblical worldview, we're going to get why he's saying, I delivered him to Satan. And if you're like me, when you hear this, you think he's like picking up Hymenaeus and Alexander and saying, here you go, Satan. But that's not really what he's talking about. Uh, he didn't personally hand them off uh, to Satan. But in a sense, what he's saying is completely true. And we're going to talk about that. So he wants Timothy, lastly, uh, to have faith to have a good conscience. And he's saying he doesn't want him to reject faith or a good conscience. And he references these two men that, that have done this. They've, they've rejected faith that they once had, and they've rejected a good conscience, which they once had. And through that, they have been delivered to Satan. They have shipwrecked their faith. What he means by this, uh, if you think about a ship being shipwrecked, um, it is busted up. It can no longer go back out to sea. There's holes in it. It's empty. Uh, they've really done damage and brought an end to the life of that uh, vessel. And so this guy, Hymenaeus and, and Alexander, um, they shipwrecked their faith. And so they abandoned their faith. They abandoned a good conscience. They went against what they knew to be right versus wrong. And they went against this faith in Christ. They abandoned, they let go of trusting in Christ and began to turn their eyes to other things. And because of this, Paul says, I have delivered to Satan. So in a biblical worldview, you really have two teams in the world. You have those who are in Christ and those who are in Satan, in the devil, in the adversary. And so if you are in Christ... In God, you're on this one side, this one team. And if you are not a part of the church, a part of, uh, in Old Testament times, the Jewish people, you were unanimously in the realm of Satan. There's other places in the scriptures in the New Testament where it says that that Satan is the, the prince of the power of the air. He is the, the present ruler that we see as he debated with Christ uh, during Christ uh, wandering in the wilderness that Satan in some way has a, a, an amount of authority and rule over earth presently. We also see this in the book of Revelation where that rule is brought to an end. But while the, the earth, as the scriptures say uh, in the Psalms, that while the earth is the footstool of God and, and is God's domain in a very re- real way, uh, Satan also holds a, a certain amount of of authority and rule and reign only because God allows him and for a short amount of time. But in in this time, in this day and age, until the return of Christ and the establishing of the kingdom of Christ uh, in the millennial kingdom and in eternity, Satan is the present ruler. So, um, (coughs) So when Paul says he delivered these two guys over to Satan, What he's talking about is church discipline. He's talking about he kicked these guys out of the church and they're no longer welcome in the church. And due to their separation from the church, they are now back into the realm and domain of of Satan. They're no longer in uh, uh, the group of the church that has a saving faith that will lead to everlasting life. They are now back among, uh, as before, a group of of people that are are separated from God and headed towards an eternal conscious torment in in an everlasting fire, a place called hell. And so he has delivered them back over to the the domain of Satan, the realm of Satan, the rule of Satan here on the earth. 
They're no longer a part of the church. And he says, so that they may be taught not to blaspheme, or blaspheme God. I want to reference two quick verses here together with you uh, concerning this, this vein of uh, church discipline. The first is uh, 1 Corinthians 5, chapter 5. Um, namely verse uh, 1 through 5. This is another thing Paul was dealing with in Corinth at the church. And he's speaking to this issue as he writes to the church in Corinth. He says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles or the unbelievers. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Talk about weird and jacked up. And you are arrogant. He says, shouldn't you be filled with grief and remove from your congregation the one who did this? Shouldn't you kick this guy out? Even though I'm absent in the body, I am present in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who has been doing such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, so he's saying, go ahead and do this, even though I'm not there, because I'm with you in spirit, as he just established. With the power of our Lord Jesus, hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. And so we're not going to get too deep into that. We'll save that as we go through 1 Corinthians. Uh, but Paul uh, repeatedly uses this example of turning one over to Satan to kick them out of the congregation to remove them from the safety umbrella, which is Christ's church, his bride, and to then place them back into uh, the world, which is separate from Christ and is not covered by the blood of the Lamb. And so uh, Paul is mentioning that in here, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. That's what he's getting at when he says, I delivered them to Satan. The other verse, I just want to briefly mention church discipline. Jesus taught us this in uh, Matthew chapter 18. And uh, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, we see some teaching. If you can see here on the screen, some red letters, we know that's the words of Jesus. He says, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. And Jesus gives us a step-by-step -step process for what to do, the what ifs, when there is sin between brothers and sisters in the church. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. So if someone sins against you, go speak to them privately, individually, and deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. He says if he listens to you, if there's repentance, a change of heart and mind, you've won this brother or sister. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, Every fact may be established. What he's saying is if the one-on-one -on -one conversation doesn't work, then take a group of people so that what he's doing here is he's safeguarding the church from, Jesus says, from people who can make a false accusation and get someone kicked out or something like that just because they don't like them. It leaves more room for sin or a wrongdoing here. But instead, if, if a group of people is brought into play, then not everyone can just be accused False accusations can't reign supreme here, and he's trying to protect people from that. But as we see here in Matthew chapter 18, uh, verse 17, if the person then doesn't pay attention uh, to this group that's confronting them on, on this public sin, uh, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. right? Someone who is other than our group, someone who is not welcome here. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. So that's why we see such a clear connection that Paul gives us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, between kicking someone out of the church and delivering them to Satan. The reason it's the same exact thing that, that these earthly realities of church life and these Heavenly realities of, of uh, Satan's dominion, they can be so intertwined because he says, Jesus, as he taught us, as Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, 
Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth or bring into the church or proclaim in the church, the universal church, will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth has been loosed in heaven or what is kicked out, people, okay, will also have been kicked out in heaven. So um, as Paul's getting at it, and as we'll see a reoccurring theme as you hear me talk about the church, the church on earth is to reflect the universal church in heaven. Uh, the attendance role, I, I've said before, in uh, our church role should reflect the attendance role in heaven. And some of the pastor's job of, of carrying out faithful church discipline on a regular basis and calling the church membership to faithful membership and faithful discipline has to do with uh, this, this keeping in check what is true in heaven with what is true here on earth, for those who are right with God, they should be a part of a local church. And those who are not right with God are going to tend to be not a part of a local church. And for those who are in a church but aren't right with God should be kicked out. And that's faithful church discipline. And that's what we see with Paul's example here of, of kicking people out when necessary. And the purpose is, as we talked on in 1 Corinthians, it's not that their soul is lost, but rather the ultimate goal is that their soul is brought back in one day. That they see the error of their ways and they see that uh, to be one in Christ means to walk in obedience and to uh, walk in truth and in love. And if people are walking away from that, they're not a follower of Christ. They're no longer a part of Jesus's group that will be saved and in heaven. And so it's such a vital thing that, that church discipline is practiced in a healthy way. And a lot of what's going on in, in these uh, pastoral epistles, namely First and Second Timothy, is he's encouraging Timothy to... Uh, practice church discipline, and we see this reference here. Uh, so that closes uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 for today. Um, the next video, we're going to be jumping into 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to talk about some more instruction that Paul gives uh, to Timothy concerning prayer and uh, concerning the, the household of God. Uh, that video should be uh, soon coming. And uh, I just want to thank you for tuning in, letting me teach you the Bible, something I really enjoy and love. And hopefully it's beneficial to you and want to always do my best to be faithful to, to teach you the word and to, as we study these chapters, to pull in other parts of the Bible that maybe you are or you aren't familiar with that can help shed some light and give us some clarity on what's going on in the text. But uh, thank you. If you enjoyed this video, it helped you. Please give it a like. If you have any questions on something we, we covered today, please comment, ask your questions in the comments down below. And uh, if, if really diving into God's word and the text of the Bible and uh, into a faithful believing and reading of the Bible is something you're interested in, and this kind of content is uh, something you really enjoy, I'd encourage you to subscribe, subscribe to this channel and, and uh, really I uh, look forward to a whole bunch more content like this that is coming. Uh, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you again.